Hello and welcome to CMG's webinar on mechanistic modeling of low salinity water flooding in plastics and carbonates. My name is Anjani Kumar. I'm the Vice President of Engineering Solutions and Marketing at CMG. I'll be the moderator for today's session. I'm pleased to introduce Fraser Skoreko, Chief Reservoir Engineer at CMG, who will be presenting today's webinar. Fraser has over 35 years of industry experience and has been with CMG since 1993. He specializes in simulation of chemical, foam, in-situ combustion, and other advanced recovery processes. Fraser graduated with an engineering degree from the University of Calgary and started his career as an open hole logging engineer at Slumberger and Dresser Atlas back in 1978. He then moved on to work as a reservoir engineer at Gulf Canada in 1980, followed by working as a consultant in Tripoli, Libya from 1982 to 85. From 1985 to 1990, he worked as a staff reservoir engineer for Alberta Energy Company, currently in Cana, in Calgary. Prior to joining CMG, Fraser also worked as a consultant in Mallorca, Spain, on Libyan reservoirs for three years. At this time, I'd like to inform you that there will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. However, you may submit your questions at any time using the chat window on the screen. We will post the recorded presentation on our website within 24 hours. You'll need to log on using the CMGL username and password to access the material. Fraser? Thank you, Anjani. The outline of this webinar will be, first of all, introduction and concepts, then mechanistic modeling of low salinity water injection, or LSWR. Then midway through, we'll switch to some practical aspects We'll look at the, uh, the wizard that's in Builder for this process and go through a quick demo for carbonates with SO4. And we'll look at the same case with temperature effects and then conclusions. So first of all, the key variables affecting this process. The first one is reservoir lithology. For plastics, the presence of clay seems to be important. Uh, it's primarily kaolinite. And in the lab, there's no benefit observed in plastics in the absence of clays. Composition of crude oil seems to be important. The presence of polar compounds in the crude is necessary. And it's these polar compounds that give the rock the oil wettability. Again, in the lab, there's no benefit seen with synthetic depolarized oils. Presence of conate water seems to be important. There's no benefit seen with dry outcrop cores saturated with 100% oil. The divalent ion content, such as calcium magnesium, in the water seems to be important. Uh, for plastics, it's SO4 that needs to be there. Or sorry, for carbonates, SO4 needs to be there. The mechanisms are, first of all, multi-ion exchange. Uh, for sandstones, it's concerned with cation exchange. For carbonates, it's anion exchange. Rock dissolution may be important. It's been shown in some uh, SP papers that the transformation of chalk to other minerals, it was suggested as a mechanism for wettability alteration. Fines migration may be important. The release of these particles uh, would improve the water wetness, and then the subsequent transportation of these particles would block some pore throats. That may divert the fluid flow and increase the sweep efficiency, but it's also possible that the fines may cause plugging and be detrimental. Interfacial tension reduction effects may be important. There's a crucial salinity at which IFT between oil and water is minimum, but uh, from the available literature to date, there's really no conclusions that can be drawn whether IFT is important or not for this process. Basic principles, first of all, the polar oil components are bound to the clay surface that, um, that makes the, the rock more oil wet. And this picture is showing how it may look on a molecular level. 
uh, the oil being bound to the clay, and then there's these um, ion bridges in between the actual clay and the oil. The ion bridge composed of magnesium, calcium, sodium. Once the low salinity water is injected, it causes the ion exchange, the sodium exchanging with calcium, um, which, um, which would reduce this ion bridge and release some of these bound oil particles, which would result in a lower SORW and a shift to more water wet. There's also a pH increase by the chemical interaction between rock, the injected brine, and formation brine. And that may be caused by either cation exchange or carbonate mineral dissolution. Once the high pH occurs, it can react with the acid in the oil to give uh, an in situ surfactant. If that occurs, then the, then the surfactant will reduce the interfacial tension and change the wettability to more water wet. Then at the bottom of this slide, I just show the, uh, the pH equations minus log of AH, and AH is the concentration of the H ion. Some examples of geochemistry. First of all, aqueous phase reactions. Some of the more common ones are the CO2 and the OH reaction. Then for carbonates, you have the NaSO4, MgSO4, CaSO4 reactions. For mineral reactions, some examples are the calcite, magnesite reactions. For carbonates, we have also dolomite and anhydrite reactions. For ion exchange reaction examples, we have sodium plus calcium, sodium plus magnesium, or sodium plus hydrogen, or for carbonates, we have, have the SO4, the sulfate, with the carboxyl ion. Now the next three slides are designed to, to help understand the aqueous and mineral reactions in GEM. So first of all, the aqueous reactions are fast compared to mineral reactions. And for that reason, the aqueous reactions are represented as chemical equilibrium reactions that occur instantaneously, whereas mineral reactions are represented as rate-dependent reactions. Now, an example of an aqueous reaction is here the CO2 plus water reaction giving H plus HCO3. Now, in GEM, the keyword it for defining the equilibrium constant is this log chem equal coefficients. You input five coefficients, and then with this equation here, you calculate the, uh, the equilibrium constant. If for this case we substitute in 100 centigrade for temperature, we calculate our log KQ equals minus 6.43, and then K is 3.7 E minus 7, so quite a small number. Now the equations for the aqueous reactions are Q minus KQ equals zero. That's over all reactions. And then the Q is given by the product of AK to the power of VK. VK is just the stoichiometric coefficients. And then AK is given by this equation on the right here, which is gamma times M. The ideal case, gamma is 1, so really it's just A is a function of M, which is molality or concentration. So essentially, the KEQ, the equilibrium constant, gives the ratio of concentrations of products over reactants. And essentially, KEQ equals Q from this equation here. So if Q is less than KEQ, then the equilibrium will favor the products if Q is greater than KQ, then equilibrium favors the reactant. Now for this example, if you substitute in some numbers for the CO2 concentration of 0.1 molality, mole fractions of H and HCO3 are equal to a mole fraction of CO2, then Q is 1.9 E minus 5, which is greater than our KQ, so the reaction favors the reactant. So the 
there's excess CO2 in the system and a lot of it stays as CO2. However, if the CO2 concentration is now changed to be 0 0.01 molality, then the calculated Q is 1.9 E minus 7, which is now less than KQ, and now the reaction favors the products, and our H plus HCO3, our carbonic acid, is created. Now, a mineral reaction example is given here, the calcite reaction. So again, we have our uh, keyword giving us our five coefficients. We substitute in 100 again for temperature. We calculate KQ equals 4.81 for this case. Now the equations for the mineral reactions are a little different here. Here the reaction rate is given by our A sub beta, which is the reactive surface area, times K sub beta, which is the rate constant given by this equation on the right, which is our normal Arrhenius equation, which has the activation energy, gas content, constant, and temperature. And then it's multiplied by this 1 minus Q over KEQ. Now that ratio of Q over KEQ, we call that the saturation index. So if that ratio is greater than 1, then dissolution occurs. If it's less than 1, then precipitation occurs. So for this case, if the molality of calcite is large compared to KEQ, then mineral dissolution occurs, but it occurs at a rate governed by the rate constant and the reactive surface area. Now in GEM, we model the wettability alteration using relative permeability interpolation. The choices for the interpolant in the order of preferences are, first of all, the ion exchange or the equivalent fraction on the rock surface of an ion undergoing cation exchange. Second choice would be the phase molality of any aqueous species, you know, typically sodium, calcium, or sulfate. And then third choice is the porosity fraction change due to mineral deposition or dissolution. Now, GEM has been validated against a number of other geochemistry packages. It's been validated against FreeQC, Geochemist Workbench, and by Total using their internal software. This picture is showing a comparison against FreeQC. You can see that the two geochemistry simulators pr predict more or less the same result. Uh, GEM has also been validated against laboratory data here. Um, we see here in the picture is um, uh, comparison against lab data. The lab data is the points, FreeQC is the dashed lines, and GEM is the solid lines. You can see that in this particular case, GEM gave a better match than FreeQC. Now, with both plastics and carbonates, CO2 seems to be a very important uh, part of the whole process. And usually the oil will contain some small amount of CO2, maybe one mole, mole percent or something like that. Um, then when you inject the low salinity water, what will happen is that the CO2 will partition more into the water. So you see down here at the bottom a plot of the CO2 solubility in water. You see at high, high um, uh, salt concentrations, the CO2 solubility in water is fairly low. But as you, as you get lower, like seawater here, or low salinity water somewhere here, the CO2 solubility in water becomes much greater. So that is why the water or the CO2 will partition more into the water when the salinity is lower. So when that uh, CO2 partitions into the water, then calcite will dissolve and provide a surplus of calcium that may or may not absorb. So in low salinity with CO2, the absorption of calcium will prevail in sandstone as opposed to calcium desorption. 
However, it's speculated that the change in wettability depends on the degree and amount of ion exchange, irrespective of whether calcium will absorb or desorb. So all of this together really means that the investigation of low salinity without the presence of minerals and CO2 could give erroneous results. Now in plastics, since ion exchange on the clay surface seems to be the driving mechanism, the modeling of the mineralogy and clay distribution is essential for uh, getting good predictions of low salinity. And this table is just showing a typical water analysis from the North Sea uh, sandstone reservoir uh, showing the different ion contents. Now, there, se there seems to be uh, less understanding of low salinity effects in carbonates. There's uh, quite a few difference of, of opinions as to the main mechanisms. So for that reason, I'll go through a short literature search here for carbonate. So the first um, paper here is by uh, Hazim al Attar in the Buhasa field. It's showing that the increased calcium concentration of the injected brine resulted in decreased oil recoveries. So if you look at the plot on the left bottom here, um, other than the distilled water case, uh, when the calcium concentration starts increasing. Here the green curve is the lowest one giving highest recovery. As it increases your recovery starts decreasing. They also concluded that increasing the SO4 concentration in the brine changes the wettability to more inter intermediate levels and gave more oil recovery but there also seems to be some optimum concentration. So if you look down here the plot on the right the distilled water case gives the minimum case, then a very small concentration of SO4, give, the green curves gives fairly high recovery. You increase it further, your recovery decreases. Then you get to this, this red curve, the 46.8, which goes up to the maximum, the optimum case. Then you increase the SO4 further, and your recovery now drops down to almost the distilled water case. Now this paper from the University of Denmark concluded that there is no effect observed on core flood at 25 degrees C, but at reservoir temperature 90 degrees C they saw a substantial increase in oil recovery. They also saw that the formation of an emulsion phase was observed with an increase in the sulfate concentration at high temperature and pressure. So that emulsion phase is normally associated with surfactant and IFT effects. Now this paper from Abu Dhabi Petroleum Institute concluded that at 90 degrees C the water wetness enhancement of carbonate rock is realized by reducing water salinity or increasing sulfate concentration, whereas the divalent cations had very little effect on wettability alteration. So the, the results indicated that the wettability alteration and fines migration may account for the favorable performance in carbonates. Now this paper from the University of Texas using flow simulation, not lab tests, showed that anhydrite dissolution con contributes to wettability alteration, but it's not the main contributor and the results of low salinity in carbonate rocks are best explained as wettability alteration due to the change in surface charge instead of anhydrite dissolution. Now this paper from Saudi Aramco concluded that the SO4 ions introduced alone are very actively absorbed onto the carbonate rock surface increasing the surface charge. However, other water molecules cannot bind to the surface ion sites because they're already occupied by the SO4 ions. In another experiment they did, with all ions introduced together, they all interact with the carbonate rock surface and the total surface charge change is based on the amount of ions introduced. Then Ousted concluded that with core flooding, uh, the in situ generation of the sulfate ion created from the dissolution of anhydrite 
is the catalyst in the wettability alteration process. And dissolution of fines migration changes are due to the binding of the SO4 ions with the ions on the carbonate rock surface. Okay. Before Fraser goes into um, the new builder wizard for modeling of uh, low salinity uh, water flood, I'd like to pose a question to our attendees today. And the question will show up on your screen. The question is, are you aware of the geochemistry capabilities available in GEM? And there are three options. Uh, you can respond by clicking on one of the three options. The options are, I have used geochemistry in projects before. The second option is yes, but I have never used it. And the third one is no, I was not aware of it. Uh, the responses are coming back. And uh, the system is analyzing those responses. Uh, based on the responses here, it's 15% uh, uh, say I have used geochemistry in a project. Around 41, 42% uh, say uh, yes, but have never used it, and 43% no, I was not aware of the geochemistry feature in GEM. So hopefully uh, today's uh, webinar uh, will showcase some of the features and capabilities on geochemistry modeling that is available in CMD simulators, and hopefully you will get a chance to use them uh, on your projects and evaluate uh, uh, geochemistry and low salinity water flooding as one of the potential recovery methods uh, for your reservoir. Okay, now I'll continue with um, some more practical aspects of modeling this process. So now I've, I've switched to a live version of Builder, and I'll just show the uh, process wizard. So I've got a, um, a typical GEM data set loaded. Uh, it does not have any aqueous reactions or components or anything. So I'll go to the components menu and go to the process wizard here, choose the option low salinity water, click next, and now we, uh, we have the basic process wizard here, and what, the way it's designed, it's di designed to be used um, possibly multiple times. So um, right now what we see is the only thing that's really visible is our rel perm options, so if we already had an existing aqueous reaction structure, we could preserve that and then just change the rel perm options in case uh, we wanted to do some history matching or something like that. Now in this case, we don't have anything. We can see here the number of aqueous components and mineral components are zero. So we need to create something. So we check this box here to change it. Now we see that we have some some reactions uh, available to be selected. Now we also have some defaults built in here. There are five defaults, two for clastics and three for carbonates. We're going to choose the SO4 option here for this demo. So I'll just go ahead and choose that. Now we see that um, the, the wizard has now given us some default reactions aqueous reactions, some default mineral reactions. It's also populated some rel perm values and it's allowed us to input some initial aqueous concentrations and mineral concentrations. Now these are supplied by default. Now if there's some reactions that you think you need to add, you can always add some more here by checking here. Now you see here is a, a short list of the more common reactions for aqueous uh, reactions. Um, and here for the mineral reactions, a short list of the more common ones. Now if you have some lab data or there's something, how, something you want to simulate that is not here, you can check this box here and then uh, it will show all the reactions that are in the database. Now you can see the whole list of reactions, you know, 500 some reactions here for aqueous and for mineral reactions here, the whole list from the database again, you know, many reactions which may or may not be relevant for your case. So now I'll switch back to the presentation. At this time, uh, I like to pose another question to the attendees and the question is, 
is low salinity water flood a potential EOR method candidate for your current or future projects? You can select it uh, or respond by selecting yes or no on your screen. So it looks like uh, responses are coming back in and based on the responses received so far, which is 85% of the attendees have voted, 79% say yes, they have a, a potential candidate a reservoir uh, that is uh, suitable for uh, low salinity water flood uh, modeling and 21% say no. Uh, so in general, I think uh, the methods uh, described today will be really helpful uh, on, uh, on using this uh, low salinity water flooding modeling capability on your uh, current assets or even uh, future projects. Okay, I'll now continue with the um, with looking at what the wizard has given us. So this slide is just showing how to load it um, in the wizard. Now, so this one is showing, uh, describing a little bit more detail the results. So as I said before, you know we got uh, some default reactions, aqueous and mineral reactions. It's also um, set some rel perm numbers and defaults for us. So it's set the SO4 ion to be the interpolant here, and it's also set the, um, the, the concentration to begin and end the interpolation and the number of rel perm sets. It's also set for us the, these SORW reduction numbers, and what those are is a ratio of the SORW from low salinity divided by the SORW from water injection for each rel perm set. Now, the reason a ratio is used so that uh, multiple rel perm regions can be handled. You may have several or even hundreds of different rel perm sets, um, and each one may have a different SORW. So this is a method of uh, reducing the SORW by the same factor in all those rel perm regions. And then the same thing is done for the KRW, um, again changing to be more uh, water wet. We use a ratio of the KRW from low salinity divided by a ratio of the KRW from water injection for each rel perm set. There's also an option to change the curvature when the SORW is less than 0.1, in other words, when you have normalized rel perm curves. Now, with the rel perm curves, we can have two main different scenarios. So first of all, if your curves are normalized, in other words, if SWC is zero and SORW is zero. Now that poses a bit of a problem because we're trying to shift the curves to be more water wet. Normally, what we do is reduce the SORW. But if the SORW is already zero, we cannot reduce it further. So the really the only way of shifting the curves to be more water wet is to change the curvature. So the top plot on the left is showing uh, an example of a normalized curve. The blue curve is the, the uh, water flood curve and then the magenta curve is the um, low salinity curve where we've changed the curvature to be more uh, to more um, water wet. You can see the crossover points shifting to the right here. And here on the right is the same curves except that's after block scaling. Again showing our SORWs are the same uh, because of our normalized curves. So the only way to shift it is to change the curvature. Now the second scenario is when we do not have normalized curves and that's more or less the preferred method. Um, you can still have uh, block endpoint scaling, but um, non-normalized curves, in other words, SWC is greater than zero and SORW is greater than zero. So this plot down here on the bottom right is showing how we just change, in this case, the SORW from 0.25 to 0.15. We don't have to change the curvature and 
that's the preferred method. And the reason being is because many times our rel perm curves are from a history match. You don't really want to start messing around with the curvature because uh, you may get unexpected results. So for that reason, it's not recommended to use normalized curves for this kind of simulation. Now I'll continue with this example with the SO4 interpolation. So I'm showing here the, uh, the plot here is the same one from the uh, literature search on carbonates of our SO4 concentration. If we take these values here and put them into a table, we can make a table here like this one on the right of our SO4 concentration, our recovery factors, and our SORWs uh, from those recovery factors. And then now we can easily calculate our ratio of SORW. So in this case, our ratio of 0.482 is simply this number, 0.2152 divided by 0.4465. So these are the numbers we need to input to the wizard here. Also, what we need to input to the wizard is the uh, pH of the formation water, in this case 5.22, and then the wizard will calculate the H ion for initialization. We also need to input uh, mineral volume fractions. In this case, we input uh, calcite and dolomite to be 0.5. Since it's a carbonate, we have high concentrations of both calcite and dolomite. Um, we also need to input our initial formation water concentrations of ions. Um, we can click next in the wizard, select all the rock regions, next, enter our injected water composition, which is either seawater or low salinity water, and then click finish and we'll be done the wizard. I'm not going to show those steps here. Um, but uh, so what we end up with here is uh, what the, the wizard added, and as I mentioned, we got our aqueous reactions, our mineral reactions. It set our rel perm options here, uh, plus our, uh, the numbers required of those rel perm options. It's also uh, going to set our initial aqueous compositions and our initial um, mole fractions, or sorry, volume fractions of minerals and our injected water composition. So now if we look at uh, what the wizard gave us for rel perms, we can open the diagnostic plots in Builder and show the rel perm curves, and I've um, reproduced them here in this slide. They're, the two pictures are the same rel perm curves. The one on the left is linear, one on the right is log. On the left plot, we can see the, uh, the KRW change. It's using three-point scaling. so our KRW at residual oil is changed. Our water flood curve is in red here. Our optimum case, our set number two, is the green case here, giving us our lowest KRW. And then our slightly less than optimum case, the blue curve, is a slightly higher KRW. On the right here, the SORW, we can see the water flood case is 0.25. The optimum case, again, set number two, is here 0.25 times 0.482 or 0.12 and our slightly less than optimum case is the yellow curve. Now we look at the results. We can first of all compare the oil rate between the low salinity case and the seawater case. In this example the injection begins 2015 and this example Ha happens to have a oil production plateau that is imposed by the operator. So we don't see any low salinity effects until it uh, falls off the plateau and then we see some differences between the curves here. So in other reservoirs where you, you don't have this oil production plateau, you may see benefits from low salinity earlier and that would of course depend on your withdrawal and injection rate. If we look at oil recovery, the top plot here, we see that the low salinity case gives us about 9% incremental oil over the seawater case, which is substantial 
that's over 25 years. The bottom plot is our water cut, so with low salinity water we have lower water cuts. Now if we look at our ion concentrations, what we can do is do a property versus distance plot through the middle of our model, right through the injection well. So the, uh, the very middle of this plot will be the injection well. So this is a vertical cross section through it. So the top plot is calcium, middle one is magnesium, bottom one is sulfate. So we can see here the, the seawater case, the green curve, um, our calcium concentration decreases somewhat um, because our, with seawater the calcium is less than our formation water and then of course low salinity water is even lower. With magnesium uh, we see again some drop in the magnesium content. For the seawater case we do see a little bit of an increase in the middle here due to some reactions that are occurring and then for the bottom plot we see our most important parameter here for this case is our SO4 concentration. We see for seawater the SO4 actually increases. That's because the seawater actually has more SO4 than the initial formation water. And then the low salinity water is of course the lowest. Now if we look at um, oil saturation and do cross sections again, the same cross section, uh, we see the top plot is at 2018 after three years and the bottom plot is after 25 years. So we see after three years that there's a significant um, oil saturation reduction but it's fairly localized to the injection well after three years but after 25 years it's quite a large area where we see a, uh, a, a good drop in the oil saturation. Now if we look at um, the porosity changes due to minerals, we can again do a property versus distance plot through the middle. And what we see here is the seawater case in green is actually giving us a larger porosity change than the low salinity case. And we can also see that this is a negative change. So negative values mean precipitation. So there's with seawater, there's more precipitation occurring. Then the bottom plot here is the permeability reduction as a result of this porosity reduction. So we can see here that with seawater, there's a fairly significant uh, permeability reduction of 0.8. Now if we try to analyze that a bit in more detail, we look at the calcite reaction and our concentration. So our initial calcium concentration is 18,000 ppm. With seawater it's much less, it's 511 ppm and low salinity water it's 26 ppm. So what happens is when the low salinity water is injected and in this case either seawater or low salinity water, um, the CO2 that's will partition more from the oil into the water as I explained previously and then when that happens then a CO2 reaction occurs in the aqueous phase that creates HCO3. Once that HCO3 is created and when calcium is in surplus in the presence of that HCO3 it drives this equation to the left and causes precipitation. Now if we analyze this further and we look at the calcite and dolomite behaviors, we see that they're opposite to each other. So the calcite is precipitating the top plot here, negative values. Dolomite is dissolving the bottom positive values here. And again, seawater is maximum. So again, if we try to analyze that in detail, we look at the two reactions of calcite and dolomite, we see that they're quite similar. Um, the only difference being dolomite has the magnesium in there, but the main difference in this case is going to be the equilibrium constant. So for calcite, it's around, around 2. For dolomite, it's about 3.4. And because of that, the calcite reaction occurs at a lower concentrations 
Um, so the surplus of HCO3 and CA causes precipitation. And therefore, a deficiency of HCO3 and calcium ions are created in a surplus of H. This deficiency and surplus causes the dolomite reaction go to go to the right and causes it to dissolve. Now, if we look at the pH changes with time, there's two movies here we can look at. The one on the left is seawater. One on the right is low salinity, so I'll just start the movies. So we can see that the, um, the seawater case, uh, the pH is lower, so we have our higher pH with low salinity water. We can also see that the pH changes occur over a fairly large area. Now, if we do the same case and turn on the thermal option in GEM, we can now look at some temperature effects with this exact same case. So it's very easy to turn on the thermal option in GEM. We just need to supply a couple of thermal properties, the rock heat capacity and the rock thermal conductivity, put in a keyword thermal on, and then supply an injection temperature, and then run it again. Now, if we can see here when we plot temperature that there's quite a large region of uh, cooled down reservoir, so the, um, the, the actual region is quite large, showing that there could be quite a significant effect. Now we plot our oil recoveries, and the th the, what we see is that there's not really any change of the oil recovery, and that's because we're, the oil recovery is really given by our rel perm interpolation and we haven't really changed anything with rel perm interpolation. The SO4 concentration is still the same. So we don't see really anything different there, but we will see some differences in the SO and mineral uh, behavior. So here we're looking at the SO. Top plot is after three years. Bottom plot is after 25 years. The red curve is the thermal case, the blue one is the low salinity case. So there's not really much change after three years, but after 25 years we do see some changes of the oil saturation distribution. So there is some changes there with, with the thermal effects. But now when we look at the mineral um, reactions and the mineral uh, precipitation, we see, we see quite a large effect. And again, the red curve is the thermal option. Uh, the top plot is the delta porosity. Bottom one is the permeability reduction. We see that with the temperature effects included, there's really almost no delta porosity or no permeability reduction. And that's because at the very low temperatures, the injection temperatures of cold seawater, the mineral reaction rates are very slow. So I guess that's a fortunate thing. Uh, we don't see a lot of plugging. Now if we look at the pH between thermal and isothermal cases, the plot on the left is the low salinity case. One on the right is the isothermal. We see quite a large difference in the pH behavior. So in conclusion, we can conclude that GEM can model the low salinity water injection process for both clastics and carbonates using various mechanistic modeling methods to duplicate laboratory results using detailed geochemistry. And it's this mechanistic modeling that is essential to really duplicate things correctly. Um, however, which method is selected is dependent on specific reservoir properties and on the laboratory results obtained, especially in carbonates. Um, temperature effects can be significant and should be included in the simulations. Thank you, Fraser. Uh, we will now take up uh, questions. If you have any questions and have not already submitted it, you can do so using the chat window on the right of your screen. Time permitting, we will try to answer as many questions as possible. However, if your question is not answered in this Q&A session,
somebody from CMD will follow it uh, with you uh, in the individually within the next few days. I see uh, there are several questions that are coming up uh, on the screen here. And the first question is from George Dimitri, and he'll like to know is how much extra computing is required based on the number of reactions selected? Okay, it's actually not the number of reactions selected, it's the number of components you use. So the, uh, the time goes up pretty much um, linearly with the number of components. So it's usually, as you add one reaction, it's usually one more component. There, there may be some reactions where you add two more components, um, but what I would suggest is, you know, for your particular process, just um, use, to, to begin with, use many reactions, all of them that you think may be applicable, and then run some sensitivities to see which reactions are really important or not, and then probably you can remove a number of the reactions which will uh, remove a number of your components to, to sort of optimize your runtime. The next question is from Adidapo Ayolayo, and he'd like to know is, is there a possibility of including reactions that aren't in the database? Yes, absolutely. The, um, the database is really just set, th set up there for an easy method to include reactions, but if you have a reaction that is not in the database, you can very easily add it but you would have to do that manually in a text editor in the GEM data set. The next question is from George again, and he'd like to know is, does the temperature option allow for over and under burden constant temperature effects? That one, I'm not sure of. It, it does in STARS. Um, I'm not sure GEM has that option yet. I could check on it and get back. If Okay. Uh, the next question is uh, from Mehdi Banohar, and he'd like to know is, what are the screening criteria to decide which water flooding type we should select? Uh, do we start with some lab experiment and then further optimize our process using the simulator? You would really need to have lab tests. I mean, you can do some, some screening simulations and kind of guess as to what your parameters should be. I mean, there are some, you know, quite a bit of literature values out there, you know, some numbers that you can use from the literature, but of course your reservoir may be very different from what they used in the literature, so you know, I'd recommend getting some lab tests. The next question is from Rico Potivian, and he'd like to know is, does the mechanism take into account changes in capillary number, like that is the D-trap, along with the relative permeability shift? For this process, you don't really need the capillary number uh, interpolation. Uh, GEM does have that option, um, but we use that for different processes. Uh, for, for low salinity, you don't really need capillary number changes. Okay. The next question is from Jeremy, and he'd like to know is, how do I get my geochemistry data in terms of reaction kinetics, and how do I validate that the geochemistry information that I've imported in my simulation model is correct? Well, again, I would suggest uh, if, if you don't really know what your geochemistry should be, um, I would should suggest starting off with, you know, a, quite a few reactions um, you know, maybe start with what the wizard gives you. You may want to add in a few more, and then as you can run some sensitivities and try to uh, eliminate some reactions and some components that are not really very necessary. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Jose, and he'd like to know is on which parameter is the KR interpolation uh, based on uh, in plastic reservoirs? Uh, in plastic reservoirs, the, um, the interpolation should be normally based on calcium ion, um, the, uh, the 
ion exchange for calcium. You can use ion exchange for sodium. You can also use the, um, the concentration, the molality of any aqueous component like calcium or sodium uh, for the interpolation. But probably the recommended one for clastics is the ion exchange. The next question is from Ibrahim, and he'd like to know is, does electrochemistry play a role in the low salinity water flood recoveries? Well, yes, it does, and that's basically the, the cation exchange uh, that we model. Okay, uh, the next question is again from uh, Rico Potivian, and he'd like to know is, have you calibrated this mechanism to any field project for validation? We have calibrated to lab tests. Uh, we have not yet internally calculate or calibrated it with field data, but some of our clients may have done that, um, but we might not be aware of that. The next question is from Mehdi, and he'd like to know is, does asphaltine wax deposition and water injection projects happen? If yes, can we add these reactions phenomena to our deck files? In particular, there are some concerns when you have CO2 with the injected water. Well, yes, there is uh, asphaltine and wax deposition occurring in some reservoirs, um, especially with CO2, you will get asphaltine deposition. And GEM models that very well with the asphaltine option. Um, that's uh, something separate from the low salinity case that we're talking about today, but they can be used together. Like you can, you can model both asphaltine deposition uh, with the low salinity process. The next question is from Arif, and he'd like to know is how do you calculate the permeability reduction due to the porosity change? Well, Jim has. Um, uh, two different equations you can use for that uh, and you need to supply some parameters for, for those um, correlations. Um, the default parameters in GEM are kind of average default numbers so I mean that would be something you would have to calibrate using lab data because your your lab data may show some, some plugging that is either greater or less than what the GEM defaults are. The following question is from Xianhui Kong, and he'd like to know is what grid resolution is needed for accurate simulation of the reactions and the flowing process? Well, for chemical floods, we normally recommend a maximum grid size of 10 by 10 meters. But now for low salinity, it's not quite so uh, velocity dependent um, as chemical flood, so you could probably relax that somewhat. Uh, we, we don't have an exact number to use, but uh, you could do some grid sensitivities to, to tell you uh, what is the, the maximum grid size you can use. Okay, thank you, Fraser. Uh, that's all the questions uh, we had in, in today's session. Uh, we hope you have gained a better understanding of the mechanisms involved in the modeling of low salinity water flooding and the various features and capabilities available in CMG simulators. CMG uh, does offer a multitude of training courses for all skill levels. Uh, for those of you who are interested in knowing more about low salinity water flooding, we do offer a one-day custom course on low salinity water, modeling, water flood modeling using GEM. We also offer company-specific customized courses on a variety of other subjects all around the world. Uh, for more information our, on our training courses, I invite you to, to visit our website at, uh, at www.cmgl.ca. We will post today's recorded presentation to our website within to, uh, the next 24 hours. Uh, please log in using your CMGL username and a password to access uh, the material. If you have any other questions related to the material presented today or you'd like to know uh, more about our other product offerings, please do not hesitate to contact us by email to sales at cmgl.ca. Again, thank you all for joining us for the webinar on mechanistic modeling of low salinity water flooding in elastics and uh, carbonates. Thank you.